Okay, good morning, guys. Final day of the week, 27th of September, so let's get straight into the action. Um, I will give a sort of full rundown on the uh, the news flow overnight. You know, uh, one of the main features from yesterday was this testimony um, on Capitol Hill over in Washington, uh, this Trump uh, impeachment saga just uh, escalating. Um, but so we'll talk about that um, a bit later. But I want to get straight into the action here because we've had a bit of a move lower on the pound this morning. And I'm just going to bring this cable chart and make it a little bigger. We're looking over the last uh, few weeks here. I've got a one hour chart. This is sterling versus the dollar. Um, just add a couple of lines on here. But, you know, certainly we've had a, a nice steady downward trending um, scenario here as we've been through this week. Um, and indeed, I mean, I'll just quickly go to the daily chart. You know, this has been the theme. Yeah, we've had kind of three quite steep down days uh, in a row, if you include this one as well. Um, but that's coming off the top of what had been a, a, a rebound. September had been pretty positive for cable, coming off the 120 handle that we had tested back at the start of the month. It had been a pretty solid climb up to 126. You know, up to test the areas that we'd seen mid-July, um, but certainly, yeah, this week it certainly came come under a lot of pressure as we've had the all the you know developments uh, with regards to the proroguing of Parliament being made illegal and all the rest of it. And so sterling's been under pressure, and just now this morning we're down testing this low from the 27th of August. But if I zoom in back to the one-hour chart, you'll see what happened. Um, we broke through the. Low, low point from yesterday. So yesterday we had a nice you know, extension of the trend lower, um, trading down to test S1. Um, if I just get my rectangle, so here, S1 here was down, tested at 10 a.m. and then we bounced and consolidated. So this morning drifting um, sort of sideways overnight, nice resistance at the pivot level earlier on, and then we're down and we've broken through yesterday's low, down through S1, and um, the, 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 the reason for this was some comments made from um, someone from the Bank of England. So if we just have a quick look at the, the headlines here. So Bank of England Saunders has said that uh, prolonged high Brexit uncertainty could warrant looser monetary policy if global growth remains disappointing. Um, so he, he's got a speech today. This is a pre-release um, of the text of his speech and um, a kind of picking out of the main points. Um, he's talking about these adverse effects of high uncertainty are becoming clearer in the UK macro data. He's saying the economy has slowed markedly since earlier this year. Uh, the economy has not crashed, um, but the effect of Brexit uncertainties is perhaps akin to the economy developing a slow puncture such that growth has slowed to a mere crawl. Uh, some further monetary tightening, limited and gradual, probably would be needed to return inflation to target on a sustained basis if global growth recovers, if global growth recovers, and Brexit uncertainties fall significantly. So he's basically saying that if this weakness um, in the global growth situation improves and if the Brexit risk disappears, then yes, maybe the Bank of England should be looking to hike rates. But he's saying in the absence of that, if we do get a continuation of Brexit uncertainties, you know, if Brexit gets pushed to 2020, or if you know, Boris tries to come out of the EU with no deal on Halloween, um, then obviously that will prolong the Brexit um, damage on the UK economic confidence. And it's not looking like the global situation is going to improve anytime soon. So um, certainly the headline is dovish. Um, you know, prolonged high Brexit uncertainty could warrant looser monetary policy. So the pound um, certainly die. I mean, it's trending lower anyway, and this just helped it along to continue the downward trend. So a nice breakout here this morning, taking uh, sterling a little bit lower. Um, I mean, where are the Bank of England? If we have a look at the uh, Bank of England interest rate chart here. So um, this is looking back over the last few years, of course, and they, they cut rates when we voted to leave the EU back uh, so actually, August 2016, the Bank of England cut rates, um, and just a little tweak lower, 25 basis points down. So they cut from 0.5% to 0.25%, just to try and um, allay people's fears and panic in the immediate aftermath of that um, surprise vote 
or the surprise result of the vote. Um, then they hiked rates at the end of 2017, and that's because it was like, oh, hang on, actually, this Brexit risk hasn't had the damaging effect on the UK economy that we had thought. And actually, really, more than that, it was actually the global economic situation was very bullish at that point. 2017 saw the highest uh, global growth rate since the crisis. And uh, the UK benefited from that, like everyone, when the global growth story is positive, then um, the UK benefited. And actually, therefore, the Bank of England hiked rates, um, you know, reversing that emergency cut after the Brexit vote. Uh, so they hiked rates end of 2017, then they hiked again in 2018 for the same reasoning that, you know, the global growth story at that point was very bullish. Inflationary pressures in the UK were starting to build. And so they, they hiked to 0.75%. Now, ever since then, we've been flat. And of course, as we've gone into the second part of 2019, um, you know, the global growth story has deteriorated and Brexit continues to rumble on unresolved. And as Saunders has been saying, you know, the uncertainty of Brexit alone carries quite a damaging effect on the underlying economic system. You know, it's a confidence thing. We, we just don't like uncertainty. You know, human beings will tend to uh, fear the worst, prepare for the worst, when we're not sure what's going to happen. And so it's having, it's biting. And so um, Saunders perhaps opening the door here for um, a potential rate cut from the Bank of England. They've got um, a meeting at the start of November, um, which is their quarterly um, inflation report meeting. This is the big one. Normally they only change uh, interest rates um, at one of their, what, what's called their QIR. Um, so every other meeting carries uh, extra importance where they update their inflation forecasts, they update their growth and unemployment forecasts. And this is where we also get a Mark Carney press conference where he explains everything. These tend to be the occasions where they actually make moves on rates. So you're, you're seeing the pound here this morning just um, elevating the probability that we're going to see a rate cut from the Bank of England in November. It's going to be interesting because their meeting is literally the week after the current Brexit deadline, Halloween. So um, obviously, we're probably going to be right in the thick of the action. Is Boris going to try and take us out of the EU with no deal? And then would there be a Supreme Court kind of uh, intervention ruling that illegal? And it's going to all be a bit messy. So um, certainly... Bank of England rate cuts getting priced in. So let's um, let's change change up the story then. What else is going on? And here's the kind of main feature of yesterday afternoon. Um, this is all about the Trump impeachment situation, of course. Uh, his telephone call with the Ukraine president. Did he threaten to withhold? military aid in return for information about Biden, information that he can use to try and help his, um, his prospects in the general election that's going to take place in November 2020. Um, now, so just know the latest piece in ITV. Let's just turn that down. So um, we had a testimony, live testimony from Joseph McGuire here, um, acting director of national intelligence. So he got shoved in front of Congress and got grilled by some angry Democrats. Um, and it's hard to know what's going on here because um, it looks like from this testimony, if I go down, the whistleblower actually made the complaint quite a while ago. So one controversy is, well, hang on, why is this complaint now only just surfaced? So it looks like they tried to quash and block and hide the complaint. But the whistleblower themselves, who remains anonymous, by the way, has sent that. Uh, this is from their complaint. I learned from multiple US officials that senior White House officials had intervened to lock down all records of the phone call, especially the word for word transcript of the call that was produced. Um, this set in action this set of actions, sorry, underscored to me that White House officials understood the gravity of what had transpired in the call. Um, other stuff about apparently their, um, the way they handled the electronic um, copy of the phone call. So uh, the whistleblower explains concerns about how the White House officials handled the transcripts. The whistleblower said it was removed from the normal electronic storage system for transcripts and put in a separate electronic system used normally for only very highly sensitive information. Um, so 
One White House official described this act as an abuse of this electronic system, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know the story here. So, um, you know, Trump is being accused. Did, I mean, they released the transcript of the telephone call, but is it the genuine transcript? I mean, the one they released, I mean, we talked about this yesterday, but the transcript they released showed Trump asking for information about Biden, but did not show Trump threatening to withhold military aid if no information was forthcoming. So, look, this is this is rolling on. Um, Trump, uh, one thing to note, I was reading this article this morning, something I didn't realise. Um, uh, where was it? So, uh, I can't find the exact quote in this article now, but it's basically saying that the whistleblower most of the intelligence that the whistleblower has is secondhand and most of what he's complaining about he did not witness himself i'm saying he it might be a she i don't know it's an anonymous person so basically the whistleblowers laid out all of these complaints but actually it looks like they didn't witness much of it at all so this forced trump into a tweet last night uh, a whistleblower with secondhand information question mark another fake news story see what was said on the very nice no pressure call another witch hunt so um, this is classic democrats versus trump and um, the election campaigns fired up i mean this is going to roll on i still don't think i mean in my view impeachment risk i just um, trump's trump's got through so many scandals in the last few years this is another one and i just don't think it's going to lead to an, a, an impeachment i mean Look, check out, I don't know, check out US stocks. They don't care. This story is not uh, of any interest particularly. And, you know, you've seen this week that generally the s and P's kind of been sideways. Where we're trading right now are the same kind of price points we were seeing at the start of the week. Yeah, we've had a, a couple of ticks lower here on the 24th. We had that break. But generally it's been quite stable as we're consolidating just below the 3,000 handle. So from a market point of view, you're not really seeing much reaction to this uh, Trump impeachment saga. Um, whilst I've got the charts open, uh, let's have a look at gold, because gold had a little bit of a move earlier. Some of you were looking at this and talking about this. Um, so really, what, th th this is a good example. So, you know, what happened here? What's the news? You know, what led gold to spike lower? And it wasn't a spike. It was kind of a you know, quite an aggressive move over about a 10 to 15 minute period. So I'm talking about this sell off in the, in the red box. Um, and this is a good example. So sometimes price moves and there isn't a fundamental reason behind it. And this is definitely one of those. Uh, what we've got here is a move below. And actually, I'm going to go back to the one hour chart. We've got a, a break below a technical level, which was set on the 25th of September. Wednesday's low, which got retested on Thursday. So you've got a double bottom here. If I, I talked about this level yesterday in the briefing. If we just kind of extend my, my uh, rectangle now to encompass the fact that it set the low for yesterday as well. So you've got quite a nice double bottom for the week here. And the market just broke it this morning. And this has taken gold prices down to almost test the $1,500 handle. Now, the reason for the acceleration in the move lower is just that there's stop orders below these key levels. So it's people are long gold. And what they're doing is they're setting their sell stop orders just below key technical support levels. And this is a key technical support level. And it got broken this morning, triggering these stop orders. Then you get stop orders triggered and selling. And this stop order selling force creates the accelerated move to the downside. So we call this a technical breakout. Um, and that's the reason for this move. And what's happened since is we've had a nice pullback. And, you know, you should be really looking for that. I mean, let me just get this, this, this technical line here on the shorter time frame accurate. So um, let me zoom back in. So the technical level, which was yesterday's low, is now providing a decent short area. So 1507 is resistance with looking for a test down at 1500, perhaps if this downward trajectory continues through the morning. Um, so a bit of action on gold, a bit of that move on cable, and it's still making new lows as I speak, actually. Um, and whilst we're here and talking about cable, and I'll bring in the euro as well. I mean, obviously, cable's been trending lower this week, but so is the euro dollar. 
And actually, underlying all of this, it's all too easy to always focus on sterling or focus on the euro. Um, you know, this week in Europe, we've had some really bad economic data. You remember right back at the start of the week, what got the downward trend moving was that really bad set of PMI numbers out of Germany and France. And so, yeah, the euro has been weak. But actually, don't forget about the dollar here. And the dollar has been strong. Um, and that's been the theme of the last few weeks. And I think it comes from that FOMC meeting that we had um, last week. Yes, they cut rates, but I think um, what we saw was that there was a difference of opinion on the committee. Um, we've been looking here, and I know you were talking about this in the room earlier, but we're looking here at what are the Fed going to do um, with interest rates at their next few meetings? And have a look at these graphics. So this is looking at Fed funds futures pricing and from the pricing of these assets we're able to effectively compute a probability of where markets think rates will be at the next meeting this is looking at the october the 30th meeting so remember rates right now are between 1.75 percent and two percent so right now the the futures pricing is giving us a probability of 55.1 percent that rates will remain unchanged and there's a 44.9% chance that rates will be cut again in October. Okay, So this has changed. Um, you know, it was the case that the probability was in favour of another cut in October. Um, so this has swung in the last week. But if, I think what's much more important is the December meeting. For me, the chances of an October cut, I don't, I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think it's the Fed style. They tend to want to cut every other meeting, 25 basis points, you know, keep it slow and steady under control. So if you like, it is the December meeting that's the more likely one anyway. And, and certainly the stats say that. But look, um, and in one 25 basis point cut in the December meeting on the 11th of December is now at a 49.3% chance. Um, it was a lot higher than this. So the probability of a December cut has dropped uh, there's also a probability of a double cut. So I guess you're taking in October here. So the probability of a cut in October and then another cut in December was also dropped, but it's still at a decent 18.1%. Something that's gone up is the probability of no cut. So I guess what I'm saying here is the probabilities of rate cuts have shifted down, which has just fed into a little bit of dollar strength over the course of this week and that dollar strength has been exaggerated because you've had particularly when you're looking at the euro and the pound you know you've had two weak currencies there so the euro has been weak because of european data the pound's been weak obviously because of the escalating brexit risks and uncertainties and put that against a strong dollar and then that makes for you know pretty decent moves in exchange rates so you know over the course of this week you know euro dollar's gone you know, up at 111 or even 112 handle down to below 110. So, you know, a decent kind of 200 pip trend to the downside uh, for euro dollar. And cable, you know, it's been much more dramatic. We were trading up at 126 at the start of this week or end of last week at least. And here we are trading at 123. So we've had a 300 pip move to the downside here for cable. So definitely strong moves. But you know, don't forget the dollar in all of this. It's all too easy to just focus on the pound and Brexit. Just focus on the euro and European data. Don't forget about the dollar. Um, OK, a couple of other things just to wrap up. Um, I caught a story in the FT that I wanted to put on the table. Um, not for now immediately, but for a quarter four and maybe going into next year. Um, Eastern Europe currencies take strain from manufacturing and mortgages. So um, this bad data in Europe is very bad news for Eastern Europe, who are very dependent on the core big European economies such as Germany. So I'm talking particularly here about Poland and Hungary. Their economies are very dependent on Germany. Germany's economy, we think, may be in a recession. Um, and as of yet, Germany's government are not rolling out any stimulative um, fiscal policies. So you're definitely seeing the German um, economic weakness bite hard in Poland and Hungary. This has led to the Polish and the Hungarian currencies devaluing. Now, there's a big problem that's hidden under the carpet in these two countries. Um, after the crisis, in these two countries, uh, people buying houses suddenly were offered this amazing deal from Swiss banks. 
and they were offered Swiss franc denominated mortgages at interest rates that were way lower than the interest rates they would be they were offering in 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 mortgages in their own from their own banks in their own domestic currencies okay so the problem with this is if their currencies devalue well their swiss franc denominated mortgages those mortgages get get larger the interest payments for those mortgages increase and this becomes a massive problem for consumers who have who have these mortgages this came to a head in hungary believe it or not two-thirds of all mortgages are swiss franc denominated and hungary basically forced well the banks in hungary were forced into switching the swiss franc denominated mortgages into the hungarian foreign at huge losses basically the government forced the banks into um, re-denominating these mortgages at an exchange rate that was way off what markets were trading and hungarian banks took a massive hit okay now in poland this hasn't happened yet in poland which is a bigger economy a similar kind of size number of mortgages that are Swiss franc related and you got this scenario where now Polish banks are very scared that they're going to get forced into this revaluation and have to take a massive write down and of course consumers are saying these mortgages were missold they were missold these mortgages they were not told about the exchange rate risks that they were taking you know outside of their knowledge and so it looks like another banking scandal that's ready to rear its head and you might find if the European economic weakness story continues and these Eastern European cu currencies continue to devalue and you know the foreign's at a record ever low by the way um, then you know you might find this story flare up and we might get some European banking risk rearing its head over in Eastern Europe so just a story to put on your tables um, to keep an eye on in the months to come uh, let's finish by looking at the data calendar for today and um, looks to be quite a lot on it except for we've gone through some of these numbers from earlier uh, this morning um, with regards to stuff like German import prices that were um, negative but yeah just slightly worse than expected you would describe them we had French CPI numbers that were slightly lower than expected um, so you know certainly helping with that sort of euro weakness theme that we've seen this week um, but other than that we've got an economic sentiment number at a europe at 10 a.m it's not a particularly tier one release that so i'm not that interested uh, mostly the, the, this afternoon we've got core pce data uh, from the us which is important this is inflation related data we've just been talking about the probabilities of the fed hiking rates oh, sorry not hiking cutting rates and you know it's this type of inflation data that certainly the fed will be monitoring closely although i would put a caveat on this this data is for august and here we are almost at the end of september so it's not one of the head you know we're in a couple of weeks time we're going to get september cpi data that's much more important than this inflation data that we're going to get today uh, but nevertheless it's inflation data so we're going to be monitoring it and seeing if it has any kind of impact uh, we've also got durable goods orders and then michigan sentiment so this is consumer sentiment data at three o'clock but is it, be aware this is the final reading for september the university of michigan released two readings per month and it's normally the preliminary reading that's released two-thirds of the way through the month that's the more market sensitive this final reading is like an updated revised version of that preliminary reading you don't often get too much change from the preliminary and therefore this number is less market sensitive um, we've already had the bank of england saunders release his text and and he's the reason why it moved the market is because saunders is normally hawkish and of course one of his comments at least was dovish um, and that's what cut, kind of got sterling moving to the downside there um, other guys talking 915 we've got the guindos dovish speaker from the ecb um, you got feds quarrels and uh, harker and then your ecb's weidman at some point which might be a little bit more interesting given that lautenschlager the current ecb german representative stepped down and resigned this week so uh, weidman's comment who was another german representative on the ecb um, it, his comments might be a little bit more interesting given that development earlier in the week um, 
Okay, so that's the situation. Uh, stocks are pretty steady here uh, this morning. Uh, the pound's under pressure. Gold's had a technical breakout to the downside. Uh, that's uh, the DAX has just sneaked a, a new high. Um, so that's the flavor of things here as we get the session underway. So enjoy the rest of the day. Enjoy your weekends. Uh, thanks very much.